morning, everyone. Uh, so we're going to continue on with chapter four uh, on bonding. Uh, yesterday, we had a look at the different types of bonding. We had ionic, we had covalent. Uh, we'll come back and take a look at metallic bonding towards the end of this chapter again. Uh, like I mentioned, we're going to spend uh, most of this chapter focusing on covalent compounds. And in today's lesson, we're going to actually start drawing covalent compounds, especially with electron sharing. It gives rise to many different ratios uh, between atoms themselves. And because of these ratios here, we're interested in how things are actually attached to each other. So today's lesson here will be on uh, Lewis structures. Uh, these Lewis structures here are sometimes also called electron dot diagrams. So if ever they ask you draw a Lewis structure or draw an electron dot diagram, they're talking about the same thing. Uh, back in chapter two, we uh, looked at the uh, evolution of our understanding of the atom. We started with Dalton, with solid sphere. We went through the plum pudding model, Rutherford, and then got to the Bohr model. Uh, we're going to see that the Bohr model is useful for a lot of things. The Bohr model predicts how many electron shells we are. It's useful for predicting size and whatnot. Specifically in this chapter, we're focusing on chemical bonding, chemical reactivity, which means we're only really concerned with the valence electrons. So here, Lewis comes to save the day, gives us a nice shortcut. When we actually draw Lewis structures, the only electrons that we end up drawing is Lewis structures uh, describe how only valence electrons. And if you remember back in chapter two, your valence electrons are your S and P electrons, because those are your outermost electrons. The Ds will rear its head and Fs as well, but those tend to be inner electrons. Uh, describe how valence electrons uh, are distributed or how they where they are inside a molecule. So I'm just going to do one example showing you the Bohr equivalent and then once we learn the Lewis we're just going to switch over to Lewis from here on out. So let's start off with our simplest organic molecule here which is methane CH4. At first what I would have done here is I would have done a full Bohr model of carbon bonded to four hydrogens. So carbon here six protons most stable isotope has six neutrons it's going to have six electrons being neutral, so two on the first shell. It's better to say paired on the first shell. Then I start adding them on the next shell, single, 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 single. That's the Bohr model for carbon as an atom. Along comes the hydrogen. Hydrogen here only has one shell. Right? Hydrogen was minding its own business. Yes, realistically, uh, hydrogen is actually starting off diatomic. It actually starts off looking like this already, but by the time it's actually bonded to methane, where we don't need to worry about that diatomic anymore. The H is being stabilized by the carbon. Again, we're going to start seeing many times it's usually the unpaired electrons that actually do the bonding. So in this case here, well, hydrogen shares one electron, the other electron shares one electron as well, and therefore we end up making a covalent bond. I can verify that and check it. The electron activity, I believe, for hydrogen is 2.2. The difference for carbon is, I believe, 2.6. So if you look at the difference, that difference is 0 0.4. You don't always have to check every one. It should be pretty, um, pretty much all going to be covalent, but good to keep in the back of your mind here. That one there is between 0 and 1.8. In fact, even though we say there's a slight dipole, there's going to be a slight win on carbon side, we're going to, it's so minimal, the tug of war may be like a 51-49 split as opposed to 50-50, so we don't really worry about the polarity. So in that case there, that's uh, CH, uh, having made one bond here, I'm going to have four other H's come along, the H is going to attach on this side, the H is going to attach on this side, and the H is going to attach on this side. And at that point, we're going to say, well, methane is done. Methane can't handle anymore. Uh, we're going to have to satisfy something called the octet rule. So that's the full Bohr model here. What I want to show you with this uh, picture here is I didn't really need to worry about the nuclei, right? In hydrogen, I actually ignored it here. Hydrogen is actually just one proton. The proton just comes along for the ride. Even these inner electrons just come along for the ride. What if, for a Lewis model, I just did the valence electrons? So for a Lewis model, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the symbol for carbon. Carbon is C. I'm going to know that there's the nucleus and there's two on the inner shell, but I'm just going to draw these four electrons on the outermost shell. I know carbon is on row number two. I can look on which column on the periodic table, we did that during our lab, to figure out uh, it has four valence electrons. So there's C there. Hydrogen similarly here. I already started doing the Bohr model. Hydrogen is coming in with one electron, and essentially hydrogen saturates up this carbon here. It allows carbon to have all four unpaired electrons uh, now paired up and bonded, and we now have created the methane molecule. So we notice here, uh, I can represent them with a single stick. This is called the single bond. Every bond is made out of two electrons, and I'm just gonna emphasize here, usually one from each neighbor. 
So each partner, in this case here, uh, the carbon contributed one, the hydrogen contributed one. Back in chapter 3, we had seen a very special type with a ligand, where it was a coordinate bond, where both came from one neighbor. Uh, this is more the normal case. So there's a single bond here. As you step towards uh, other molecules here, we will eventually get to, say, double bonds. Every bond is two electrons, so a double bond is going to be four electrons. A triple bond, similarly, is going to be six electrons. Uh, we definitely going from single to double to triple. Uh, we would expect the strength to be increasing. So stronger bonds going from single to double triple. They're all covalent. Uh, but what's going to happen here is if you imagine, we talked about covalent bonding be the attraction between the protons and the electrons in between. As I switch from two electrons, suddenly four, or suddenly six, as the electron density increases between the two centers, that negative density is going to end up pulling the two centers closer together. So as we go from single to double to triple, what we actually end up having is actually getting a shorter bond. So if I imagine uh, coming in with a pair of tweezers and coming in to chop a bond, a single bond is nice and long. There's only one attachment, really easy to break. As we go, uh, have two sticks or three sticks here. The bonds themselves are also getting shorter. It's a little bit harder to weave your scissors around. Cutting three rods is harder than cutting one. So therefore, <clears throat> it's going to be stronger as well as shorter. Seeing as I mentioned, so that's a usual bond, right, one election from each uh, neighbor. Remember back in chapter 3, we did that coordinate bonding. So we had, so this is, you can treat it as an exception, treat it as something that doesn't follow the rule or special type of bonding. We had our transition metal with charge. This is what showed color uh, in solution. We had water come in as a ligand. Let me draw the water molecule like that there. And basically what's going to happen here is as a ligand, its job, because it has these, these ones here are referred to as lone pairs or non-bonding electrons. Because they are paired up, but they are currently not being used to attaching to things, uh, ligands donate this lone pair to share it with the copper here. Eventually what ends up forming is a covalent bond. Water can't get rid of um, copper's charge. But eventually it's going to be complex. So far it's just one water. There's going to be five waters that end up surrounding it here. But now we're going to be one centralized um, complex. Uh, and basically this is going to have formed a covalent bond. Once this covalent bond forms, this bond here is also two electrons. I wouldn't be able to tell the difference had it not been for me to actually draw this out for you. Uh, you actually see that this is a very special type of bond here. Uh, this type of bonding was called a coordinate bond. Also referred to as a dative bond. In this case here, it's both electrons come from one neighbor. So different from our regular bonding. Uh, they might ask you on a paper one question, which of these molecules have coordinate bonds? You need to see if you can analyze between, oh, is there a ligand? Is there some lone pairs? Uh, is there one partner that's contributing both electrons? And we'll see some examples of this. Uh, remember, they might say state the acid-base nature of this as well. Something that's able to, in this case here, like a ligand, do this. Let me just repeat that name there. Uh, we call it a ligand in this, cha uh, in this chapter here. Next year, we're going to generalize that. That actually calls it a Lewis base. A Lewis base is actually an electron pair donor. All right, so uh, all ligands are going to be Lewis bases here, whereas bases react with acids. A Lewis acid, same Lewis that gave us these Lewis structures in this case here, a Lewis acid is an electron pair acceptor. So all your transition metals in the earlier chapter were acids. Uh, you'll notice that, hey, I don't see any H pluses or OH minuses. That's because the Lewis definition is much more broad. Right? So a couple last rules before we just practice some questions here. Because Lewis just considers the valence electrons, just the S and P electrons, without actually drawing the Bohr model, how can I actually tell not only which shell is my valence shell, but how many electrons are on the valence shell? You did this during your periodic table lab. You're going to find that if you try to draw the Bohr model, say hydrogen has one electron, lithium has three electrons, by the time you draw the outermost shell, the column number actually gives you the number of valence electrons. So. All these guys here, the alkali metals in addition to hydrogen, column number one all has one valence electron. Careful, sometimes they define what is your valence equal to. Yes, the valence here is actually equal to one as well, but I'm going to specify here how many valence electrons. Group number two here, your beryllium's, magnesium's, calciums, these have two valence electrons. IB does prefer you to talk about groups three to 12, but we know those ones there are D-block metals. 
d orbitals are inner electrons those are going to come back a little bit later on for the time being we're just focusing on the outer shell here so what technically is group number 13 with uh, i believe it's boron's column here we can just subtract the 10 there group 3 is three valence electrons that column has three all the way up to like the uh, helium and the neon these ones here have eight valence electrons so just looking at the column on the periodic table we can actually figure out um, the number of valence electrons pretty easily. That'll be your first step in drawing these valence electrons. Seeing as I mentioned it, what is this valence here? When they say the valence is equal to something, they're talking about how many bonds it potentially can make. For example, noble gases, they might have eight valence electrons, that's the, what we care about, but their valence is actually zero. They have no desire to make any bond. If I have column number 17, or you can treat that as uh, seven valence electrons here, uh, seven valence electrons for your halogens, they have a valence of one. And because the valence of one is they want to just have one extra electron and they're done bonding, they look like a noble gas, they're stable. So we're going to avoid this language of valence equals whatever. We're just going to focus mainly on how many valence electrons. Right? And it's given by the column number. If you cared later on, like in chapter 3, like size, we can look at the row number. This tells you n equals 1, n equals 2. It tells you for the Bohr model uh, which shell these number of valence selections is actually on. So we're seeing not just patterns on the periodic table. We can very quickly look at any uh, atom based on where it is on the periodic table. Tell me how many shells and also how many valence selections. Um, this is where the Bohr model sort of fails. The Bohr model can only give you the valence, just the S and P electrons. So if they're not valence, so that's why the Bohr model sort of breaks down by scandium, uh, it can't include the fact that the electron is actually on an inner shell. That's why we just simply go 2, 8, where we should have said 18, Bohr model just says 8, where we should have said 32, the Bohr model just says 8. If you really are keen on doing um, Bohr model, you just keep going 2, 8, 8, because that just refers to the S's and P's on any given row. So. That's one thing we're going to come back to as we uh, take a look at Lewis pictures in a little more detail. The other rule that we're going to do, just like how did I know the valence was 1, valence 1, valence 2, uh, we're going to always obey something called the octet rule. And we mentioned this a little bit here. Basically, elements are going to bond until they look like a noble gas. Now, we've been under the assumption noble gases are stable because they are full shell. Um, there's no real reason for that, but we just believed that, oh, you already have all the electrons you want, why bother gain electrons or lose electrons? So an octet rule here, essentially what it says is it's a tendency to fill your outer shell, your valence shell, that's the shell that collides first, that's the shell that does all the bonding, all the inner core electrons just come along for the right, tendency to fill outer shell with eight electrons. So with the exception of, let's say, hydrogen and helium, which are first shell, first shell only holds two, this one here just refers to uh, noble gas stability. Uh, most of the outer shells are 2p6 as well, so noble gas stability. So in all these cases here, whether it's ionic or covalent, we're going to try to bond things until they have eight, until they have a full shell. Uh, I'm going to just shout out to ionic compounds here. Um, Lewis pictures aren't so interesting for ionic. Let's do an ionic compound. We did NaCl yesterday. Let's do a slightly different compound like Mg and uh, fluorine. So first thing you do is not do Bohr mono, but do a valence uh, mono here. Magnesium is in column number two. I don't care how many inner shells it has. I know the outer shell is going to be two because I'm not on the first shell. Those are not paired up. Fluorine is a halogen. It's technically group 17, meaning it has seven valence electrons, two S's and five P's. I'm going to still add them single, 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 and I'm going to end up pairing them as I go. I typically go kind of top right down left, but just uh, do it whatever orientation. By the fifth one, you end up sharing. First thing that's going to happen is the magnesium is going to collide with the fluorine. If they don't collide, they don't contact, they have no chance of actually sharing these electrons. When they collide, technically speaking, we should be checking the electron activities. Now, it is a little bit cumbersome having to check all these numbers. I happen to have this in front of me here. Electron activity of 1.3, fluorine, we knew it to be 4.0. Uh, the difference, big number minus small number, says fluorine wins. Uh, it wins by, what is it, 2.7. Anything bigger than that 1.8 was enough. That fluorine actually is the uh, bully. It completely takes the electron and steals the electron to itself. So in that case there, an instant later, magnesium will be down an electron. It's now become a positive charge, having lost an electron. Fluorine, I'm just using X's to show you fluorines is actually different here. This fluorine here is now currently happy. It has the octet rule. It's done with a negative charge. So there we go. I have M. 
and I have this fluorine here, but magnesium as an alkaline usually has a plus two charge. Or you can say another way here, magnesium still has a valence electron it wants to get rid of. How can it get rid of that one here? It can't pass the electron over to another fluorine, but if I have yet another fluorine that hasn't bonded with, when this electron collides with the other electron here, again, based on the tug of war, fluorine snatches the electron, and phew, finally we end up with then magnesium now has our plus two charge, and again, I don't know the exact geometry, but it's going to be surrounded. My formula unit will have at least two fluorines around it, each of them being a negative one. We know those are all the charges that we need. I actually have a balanced ratio, but because it is an ionic compound, this will end up forming a big lattice structure. Not necessarily going to be one on top of the other, but what we're going to be expecting is sort of a, the positive surrounding itself with as many negatives as possible and vice versa. There's a few other chemistry that actually looks at how many holes and the sizes of the gaps left behind by the structure. Uh, so if you're interested in that, you can look into that in more detail. But that's all there is to ionic bonding. Uh, the only real takeaway from this here, first thing, we're going to see that you have to show all the electrons. Even if you know, oh yeah, 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 it's going to be full, you have to show all the dots. That's where your pencil lead is going to get very thin here. And you also, in case it is charged, you do need to show square brackets with the charge on the outside. Uh, moving on here, that's all there is to ionic bonding. Let's switch more so to covalent bonding. This is when we get into that fancy single bond, double bond, triple bond here. All they're going to do in this section here is they're just going to give you a handful of molecules and they're just going to be draw the Lewis structure. You're going to find that the more practice you get with this, the better you're going to be. These starting molecules are still fairly simple. You're going to look at the uh, group number here. These ones here are group number six. So oxygen has six valence electrons. And you go single, 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 single. I'm going to use dots and x's for one of them. These guys here collide. It's the unpaired electrons that do the bonding. That's going to share, and that's going to share. In that case there, by sharing both sets of electrons, each of these is made of two electrons, both from one neighbor. So we're going to call this now here a double bond. Uh, we see that this double bond here is made out of four electrons in between the two centers here, and we're going to end up getting O. I can actually use a stick uh, diagram here, but you notice I'm still uh, doing all the dots there to show you um, all the valence electrons. It's actually incorrect. You're not going to get marks if I just draw like O like this without actually drawing the non-bonding electrons. So make sure you have all these dots here, and especially make sure your dots are visible. Uh, don't like make it very hard to see. Make it very clear. So that one there is a double bond made out of four electrons. Uh, let's try another one here. Uh, let's try the molecule HCN. Right. Sometimes as the molecule starts getting bigger, it gets more and more challenging to actually uh, do this bonding here. Uh, what we're doing here is sort of the brute force method. I'm going to show you a shortcut in a second here. But all you're going to do is you're going to say, when they say HCN, they're trying to hint to you probably a H is connected to carbon, then connect to nitrogen in that order, instead of H and then N and then C. We're going to start off always looking at valence electrons because those are the ones that do the bonding. Hydrogen is group number one, carbon is group number four, nitrogen is group number five. Right? And basically, everyone wants a full octet. Everyone wants to have a full shell. I'm not even going to bother checking electrotivities because majority of these cases are going to be covalent. If you really wanted to, it should be less than that 1.8, uh, give or take what the average electronegativity is. So how many electrons does hydrogen need to share with carbon? Hydrogen is one of the exceptions. We're going to see tomorrow. Hydrogen is a small shell. Small shell only holds two electrons. It's happy with those two electrons. So upon colliding with carbon, upon sharing those electrons, when these two electrons spend time with the hydrogen, the hydrogen is happy. The hydrogen thinks it's full. The carbon is a little more happy. It used to have four valence electrons. When the two electrons swim up close to the carbon, you notice I'm double counting these electrons here. The carbon now thinks it has five. It's a little bit happier. How many more bonds does carbon need to make uh, with nitrogen uh, before it actually ends up being fully happy. So in this case here, carbon collides with nitrogen. I can share one set. I can share another set. I can share this set here. I know the geometry is a little bit off. We'll talk about geometry in a later lesson. But so far, I need to share three sets of electrons, meaning I can write hydrogen, carbon. Three sticks indicates a triple bond, but I still have those two electrons. Uh, again, terminology-wise, we call these ones here lone pairs, and any bonds that are in between, we call these ones here bonding pairs. So the ones that end up making single bonds, double bonds, are bonding pairs of electrons. Electrons are always paired up. Uh, if they're unpaired, they're radicals, and they would be unstable. 
So there's HTN, perfectly fine, but you're starting to see it's getting a little more complicated. As this picture gets larger and larger, it might start getting impossible for you to do this. So case in point here, we're going to come back to this molecule in a second. Let's try to draw the molecule triiodide, I3 minus. Whoa, that's a little bit scary already because why, why this negative here? I'm going to try to brute force it like we did normally. Iodine here is halogen, so seven valence electrons. There's three iodines, so times three. What I do with this negative is I end up adding an electron. I need one extra electron. This has stolen an electron from something, maybe an alkali metal, but now it has 7 times 3 is 21, plus 1 now has 22 electrons. So if you tried to do it brute force, you tried to go iodide, you just randomly plot them down here. If every iodide currently comes in with 7 valence electron, see if you can figure out all the attachments you need for this molecule to hold itself together. Now I can explain iodine, I2. I can explain that part no problem because having seven valence electrons, seven valence electrons, I collide, I share it, great. <clears throat> I'm happy with an I2 molecule. But in this case here, you see that there's no connection with the third iodine. This iodine here currently would just float away, let alone I haven't done the charge yet. So the question here is, how do I do this? How do I draw the Lewis picture uh, when the molecule starts getting harder? So all we're going to do here is I'm going to introduce a list of rules. I always tell people there's no chemistry in these rules. But basically, these rules here will get us to the right picture uh, without us having to do brute force whenever we're sort of having trouble. And in fact, the rules are so helpful, I would just go straight to the rules. I wouldn't even try to brute force it uh, unless I ask you another question later on. Okay. So in terms of rules here, we did the first part already. Make sure you know the total number of valence electrons. You still need to look at, well, iodine is column number 7 times 3. In case you are overall charged, count total valence electrons. Um, make a note to yourself. Add electrons for anions or remove. We had that order PSDF when we did the actual uh, chapter 2 here, but remove for cations. Make sure you know the total number. And essentially what I'm doing with this set of rules here, so far it's still the same. All I'm doing is I'm saying, well, you had seven, you had seven, you had seven. Somehow we picked up an extra electron. I imagine collecting the 22, and I, put, I just collect them in a bag. So therefore, the iodines no longer have their electrons anymore. Eventually, my final picture should have 22 on the diagram. So let's try it out here. Step two. We're going to place the central atom. Place one of them down. Connecting others with single bonds. Right. Do I really know that they're single bonds? No, but single bonds are the weakest attraction that we have. If we don't even have a single bond, like in this earlier case, the iodine is now free to go. So let's just randomly plop them down. I have I3 minus as my molecule. Let's plop the three I's in a row. In this case here, I don't really care if you put I, I, I like this. We'll come back in another lesson to talk about the geometry. But at least for Lewis, I just want to see how bonds have to be arranged so that we end up satisfying this octet. So, so far what I've done is I put in the two single bonds. I have no clue how these single bonds have formed. But what I do know is every bond is two electrons. So I've used two, I've used two. Out of the bag of 22, I've used four. I'm now down to 18. So that's what I did. I've already solved my problem. Well, my three iodines are connected. I don't yet know how that connection actually happened. Uh, in most molecules, you just have one center at a time, so it should be fairly clear. Usually, the central one is the least electronegative one. Just a nice hint for you looking at many molecules. Step three, once you have that down here, you're going to start satisfying the octet. Satisfy the octet rule uh, from the direction is going to be start from the outside atoms and start working your way inwards. So let me just redraw this here. I have I, I, I like this. I have these three iodines. I don't necessarily know how these electrons or where these electrons came from, but so far this iodine on the left currently is sharing two electrons. I would need to draw one, two, three, four, six extra electrons, and now my iodine over here is happy. Right? Same thing on this side here, iodine one, two, three, four, five, six. Now this iodine is happy. How many electrons have I used up then? So I've added another six, I've added 12. It's keeping a running tally on the side here, 18 minus the 12, I now have six electrons left in the big. These are only valence electrons. Their core electrons have been hidden by the Lewis model. I don't really care about those. 
and now I'm working my way outside to inside, I'm slowly getting happier and happier, this middle one here still isn't happy. The middle one here, when I double count these electrons, is sharing two on the left and sharing two on the right. It thinks it has four right now. How many more electrons do I need to add for this middle iodine to be happy? You should be able to say here, by the time I add four electrons, now everyone's happy. In that case there, uh, everyone's happy already. I minus the four, so six minus four, everyone's happy, and yet what it's saying here is your diagram should still have two valence electrons left over. But everyone's happy already. At this point, a couple things can happen. If I perfectly run out, so by the time you work your way outside and inside, outer iodines are happy, inner ones are happy, we should end up with no electrons overall. That's perfect, you're done. In this case here, we have the sort of weird case, what if I still have extra? By the time I work my way outside and inside, I still have more electrons to do. What you're going to do is you're going to put uh, electrons on the center atom. Yes, this would look like, oh, I've actually expanded the octet. This will actually become an exception in tomorrow's lesson. But that's what we're going to do. There's no chemistry in these rules, but this is what you're doing. So by the time everyone's happy, I still had two left over. I'm going to come along, and I'm going to still add the two, and I'm going to expand it out. I'm going to actually give it more than the eight that it wants. That is the correct Lewis diagram for triiodide because it is charged. That's where our ionic soft comes back again, square bracket with the charge in the corner. So that could happen. There was one example of being extra. It's also possible I might actually run out before everyone's happy. In that case there, I'm going to generalize here to say make multiple bonds. And I'm going to use the HCN molecule from earlier to actually figure out what's happened. Just before we do that here, you can actually see, all right, my final picture for triiodide following these rules here and comparing it to the early one. My triiodide should actually be three iodides in a row we actually have a single bond connecting both of them. So single bond, single bond. Each iodide has six outer electrons. So those probably were the electrons that it started off with. And yet somehow what's happened here is the middle iodine has the two uh, electron pairs. So single bond, single bond, but it has three lone pairs. It still has an XX, a dot, dot, and an XX like this. When we actually match up to what really happened then. So how did a picture like this end up looking like a picture like this. In this case here, we had said, well, I could predict the single bond no problem. So that predicts this one for us. What I'm going to actually sort of backtrack here, I know this is the correct Lewis diagram. Well, this middle iodine actually hogs three sets of electrons. Imagine this middle iodine here push the electrons off to the side for a second. This iodide here has picked up the negative. It's stolen an electron from someone. And what if this iodide here has actually data bonded to the middle? That data bond would look very similar to a covalent bond nonetheless. And again, I wouldn't have been able to do any of that analysis without already knowing the correct diagram. So that's why I would tell people, go straight to your rules first, get the right picture. And then in case they really ask you, is there a data bond or not, then try to brute force it and try to figure out what actually happened for the real picture to end up looking like the Lewis. So as I mentioned, uh, we're going to end off with HCN. Um, just practicing with the rules here. A lot of this chapter is starting off from Lewis, so the more practice you get, the faster you'll be with this. Let's just go straight to the rules without trying to brute force it. First rule says count up the total number of valence electrons, group column 1, column 14, column 15. So in total, I have 10 electrons in the bag. Plop them down here. Let's connect them at least with a single bond. I have no clue how these single bonds actually came to be. I'm just following the rules here to get us to the right final picture. So, so far out of the 10, I've used 2 and I've used 2. So if you keep a running tally, I'm now down to six at this point. Then I work my way outside to inside. Hydrogen is a little bit weird because hydrogen is just shell number one. Shell number one only holds two electrons. So already having the single bond here, hydrogen is already happy. Don't force hydrogen to have any more dots. It doesn't want it. But I'm still working my way outside to inside. The nitrogen on the other side currently is not happy yet. The nitrogen here currently is sharing these two electrons. I actually need all six of my electrons You'll notice I'm not doing Hunzer, I'm not going single, 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 pair, 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 uh, because I know at the end of the day, there's no chemistry in these rules anyways, but at the end of the day, they're going to be paired up because I'm going to have a full noble gas configuration. So I actually end up using all six, and now my nitrogen is actually happier. Compared to the question we did earlier, <clears throat> we were also placing down a central atom, we were making an octet outside to inside, we actually realized even by the time the outsides were happy, I still had more electrons. This time it's the run out case, where by the time I've 
made the nitrogen happy, I now have no more electrons left in the bag. That number is super important because it's going to be super tempting for you to be like, okay, carbon is not happy. I'm going to double count my electrons. Carbon has two, carbon has two. Oh, why not just come along and add four more electrons? That would make carbon happy. We can't do that because we've already said I've run out of electrons. When I collected up all the valence electrons at the beginning, when I had 10 dots, I already have a whole 10 dots on the picture. I don't have any more dots. So this is like that run out case. And in this case here, to figure out what's actually happened then, when you run out, this is when you start making multiple bonds. This is when you start converting the single bonds, which you started off, maybe you start getting double bonds, maybe you start getting triple bonds. Right? That's what I call multiple bonds. And essentially what's gonna happen is, because I worked outside to inside, the outer guys will typically have a lot of lone pairs. They're hogging on those electrons. And all that's gonna happen is I'm gonna share those electrons inside. My picture shortly is gonna look like this. The nitrogen seeming very generous here, but nitrogen's actually had no loss here. Nitrogen at first had two, four, six, eight like that. Upon sharing that electron, it still has two, four, six, eight. So nitrogen is still happier, but instead of hogging the electrons to itself, uh, it actually shares the electrons. Carbon is now slightly more happy. Let's give them a sort of a smirk kind of there. The carbon here currently has two, four, six. It's still not happy yet to be fully happy. Nitrogen needs to come in and share yet another electron. And therefore, with the rules, we end up getting the same final picture. Remember, the correct final picture must include all the dots. So if you just drew it like this, it would be wrong. It's only correct once you have shown all the dots on the picture. Some of them is bonding, some of them is non-bonding. So even the rules here had started off, oh, they're actually single bonds. By Because I actually ran out, because I started making a double bond, making a triple bond, uh, we actually realized it's actually quite a bit stronger than a single or double. If you look back to the picture that we did earlier, this is exactly the same one. I want to just emphasize and end off with just one note here. Whenever you do this sort of running out kind of business, we're going to be dragging lone pairs and we're dragging in. This one here certainly looks like it's a coordinate bond. What I want to emphasize here is this bond here. When it looks like both electrons came from one neighbor, this one may be, it may be coordinate, it may not. How do you tell for certain? Then you need to actually brute force it here. When we did this molecule earlier, this is before we actually found the rules, we had said, well, hydrogen shares one, carbon ends up sharing three pairs. Are there any places where bonds were actually made when one partner contributes both? This one here earlier in the rules, it looked like nitrogen dragged it in, nitrogen dragged it in here. And yet when you looked at it brute force, no. These were not data bonds. These were all carbon had contributed one, nitrogen had contributed one, both carters contribute one. So therefore, just be careful, especially when you're using this run out rule, whenever you're trying to make multiple bonds here, these ones always look like the coordinate. To tell for certain, you have to test this one here. These ones here are actually not coordinate. They're not data bonds because they actually came from one electron piece. So just for practice, uh, there's going to be a lot of practice on the worksheet, but try end off with here. See if you can draw the CO molecule, uh, follow the list of rules, get you to the right final picture, uh, and then um, see if it's actually a coordinate bond or not. Okay? If you have any questions, just let me know. Thanks, guys.